Welcome to the Audio Renaissance Tapes presentation of Zen and the Art of Tea, written by Daisetsu T. Suzuki, adapted for audio and produced by Tony Hutz, and read by Christopher Reed. Before beginning, I wish to make a brief personal comment on the author and the text. D.T. Suzuki, Japan's foremost authority on Zen Buddhism, and the man who introduced Zen Buddhism to Western readers, died in Tokyo in 1966 at the age of 95. Zen and Japanese culture, the work from which this program is drawn, consists primarily of a series of lectures Suzuki delivered during the 1930s in England and the United States, and should be viewed in its historical context. It is worth remembering that by the late 1940s, Suzuki expressed a wish to revise some of his earlier works on Japanese cultural identity, most especially those concerning the influence of Zen Buddhism on the Japanese martial traditions. Zen and Japanese culture, however, remains as it was originally written. It remains a brilliant and seminal work on Zen Buddhism, from a scholar of immense breadth and depth. What is common to Zen and the art of tea is the constant attempt both make at simplification. The elimination of the unnecessary is achieved by Zen in its intuitive grasp of final reality, by the art of tea in the way of living typified by serving tea in the tea room. The art of tea is the aestheticism of primitive simplicity. Its ideal, to come closer to nature, is realized by sheltering oneself under a thatched roof in a room which is hardly ten feet square, but which must be artistically constructed and furnished. Zen also aims at stripping off all the artificial wrappings humanity has devised, supposedly for its own solemnization. Zen first of all combats the intellect, for in spite of its practical usefulness, the intellect goes against our effort to delve into the depths of being. Philosophy may propose all kinds of questions for intellectual solution, but it never claims to give us the spiritual satisfaction which must be accessible to every one of us, however intellectually undeveloped we may be. Philosophy is accessible only to those who are intellectually equipped, and thus it cannot be a discipline of universal appreciation. Zen, or more broadly speaking, religion, is to cast off all one thinks they possess, even life, and to get back to the ultimate state of being, the original abode, one's own father or mother. This can be done by every one of us, for we are what we are because of it or him or her, and without it or him or her, we are nothing. This is to be called the last stage of simplification, since things cannot be reduced to any simpler terms. The art of tea symbolizes simplification, first of all, by an inconspicuous, solitary, thatched hut erected, perhaps, under an old pine tree, as if the hut were part of nature and not specially constructed by human hands. When form is thus once for all symbolized, it allows itself to be artistically treated. It goes without saying that the principle of treatment is to be in perfect conformity with the original idea which prompted it, that is, the elimination of unnecessaries. Tea was known in Japan even before the Kamakura era, 1185 to 1338, but its wider propagation is generally ascribed to the Zen teacher Eisai, who lived from 1141 to 1215. It was Eisai who brought the tea seeds from China and had them cultivated in his friend's monastery grounds. It is said that his book on tea, together with some of the tea prepared from his plants, was presented to Minamoto Sanetomo, the shogun of the time, who happened to be ill. Eisai thus came to be known as the father of tea cultivation in Japan. He thought that tea had some medicinal qualities and was good for a variety of diseases. Apparently he did not teach how one conducts the tea ceremony, which he must have observed while at the Zen monasteries in China. The tea ceremony is a way of entertaining visitors to the monastery, 
or sometimes a way of entertaining its own occupants among themselves. The Zen monk who brought the ritual to Japan was Daiyo, the national teacher, about half a century later than Eisai. After Daiyo came several monks who became masters of the art. Finally, Ikkyu, who lived from 1394 to 1481, the noted abbot of Daitokuji, taught the discipline to one of his disciples, Shuko. His artistic genius developed it and succeeded in adapting it to Japanese taste. Shuko thus became the originator of the art of tea and taught it to Ashikaga Yoshimasa, shogun of the time, who was a great patron of the arts. Later, in the 16th century, Jo'o, and especially Rikyu, further improved it and gave a finishing touch to what is now known as Cha no Yu, generally translated tea ceremony or tea cult. The original tea ceremony as practiced at Zen monasteries is carried on independently of the art now in vogue among the general public. I have often thought of the art of tea in connection with Buddhist life, which seems to partake so much of the characteristics of the art. Tea keeps the mind fresh and vigilant, but it does not intoxicate. It has qualities naturally to be appreciated by scholars and monks. It is in the nature of things that tea came to be extensively used in the Buddhist monasteries, and that its first introduction to Japan came through the monks. If tea symbolizes Buddhism, can we not say that wine stands for Christianity? Wine is used extensively by the Christians. It is used in the church as the symbol of Christ's blood, which, according to the Christian tradition, was shed for sinful humanity. Probably for this reason, the medieval monks kept wine cellars in their monasteries. They looked jovial and happy, surrounding the cask and holding up their wine cups. Wine first excites and then inebriates. In many ways it contrasts with tea, and this contrast is also that between Buddhism and Christianity. We can see now that the art of tea is most intimately connected with Zen, not only in its practical development, but principally in the observance of the spirit that runs through the ceremony itself. The spirit, in terms of feeling, consists of harmony, or wa, reverence, or kei, purity, or sei, and tranquility, or jaku. These four elements are needed to bring the art to a successful end. They are all essential constituents of a brotherly and orderly life, which is no other than the life of the Zen monastery. That the monks behaved in perfect orderliness can be inferred from the remark made by Tei Meido, a Confucian scholar of the Sung, who once visited a monastery called Jorinji. He wrote, Here indeed we witness the classical form of ritualism as it was practiced in the ancient three dynasties. The ancient three dynasties are the ideal days dreamed of by every Chinese scholar-statesman, when a most desirable state of things prevailed and people enjoyed all the happiness that could be expected of a good government. Even now, the Zen monks are well trained individually and collectively in conducting ceremonies. The Ogasawara School of Etiquette is thought to have its origin in the monastery regulations compiled by Hyakujo and known as Hyakujo Shingi. While Zen teaching consists in grasping the spirit by transcending form, it unfailingly reminds us of the fact that the world in which we live is a world of particular forms, and that the spirit expresses itself only by means of form. Zen is, therefore, at once antinomian and disciplinarian. The character for harmony also reads gentleness of spirit, or yawaragi, and to my mind, gentleness of spirit seems to describe better the spirit governing the whole procedure of the art of tea. Harmony refers more to form, while gentleness is suggestive of an inward feeling. The general atmosphere of the tea room tends to create this kind of gentleness all around. Gentleness of touch, gentleness of odor, gentleness of light, and gentleness of sound. You take up a teacup, handmade and irregularly shaped, the glaze probably not uniformly overlaid, but in spite of this primitiveness, the little utensil has a peculiar charm of gentleness, quietness, and unobtrusiveness. 
The incense burning is never strong and stimulating, but gentle and pervading. The windows and screens are another source of a gentle prevailing charm, for the light admitted into the room is always soft and restful and conducive to a meditative mood. The breeze passing through the needles of the old pine tree harmoniously blends with the sizzling of the iron kettle over the fire. The entire environment thus reflects the personality of the one who has created it. What is most valuable is gentleness of spirit. What is most essential is not to contradict others. These are the first words of the so-called Constitution of Seventeen Articles, compiled by Prince Shotoku in 604. It is a kind of moral and spiritual admonition given by the Prince Regent to his subjects. But it is significant that such an admonition, whatever its political bearings, should begin by placing unusual emphasis on gentleness of spirit. In fact, this is the first precept given to the Japanese consciousness to which the people have responded with varying degrees of success during centuries of civilization. Although Japan has lately come to be known as a warlike nation, this concept is erroneous with respect to the people whose consciousness of their own character is that they are on the whole of gentle nature. And there is good reason to presume this, for the physical atmosphere enveloping the whole island of Japan is characterized by a general mildness, not only climatically, but meteorologically. This is mostly due to the presence of much moisture in the air. The mountains, villages, woods, etc., enwrapped in a somewhat vaporous atmosphere, have a soft appearance. Flowers are not as a rule too richly colored, but somewhat subdued and delicate, while the spring foliage is vividly fresh. Sensitive minds brought up in an environment like this cannot fail to imbibe much of it, and with it gentleness of spirit. We are, however, apt to deviate from this basic virtue of the Japanese character as we come in contact with various difficulties, social, political, economic, and cultural. We have to guard ourselves against such subversive influences, and Zen has come to help us in this. When Dogen came back from China after some years of study of Zen there in the 13th century, he was asked what he had learned. He said, Not much except soft-heartedness. Nguan Xin. Soft-heartedness is tender-mindedness, and in this case means gentleness of spirit. Generally we are too egotistical, too full of hard, resisting spirit. We are individualistic, unable to accept things as they are or as they come to us. Resistance means friction. Friction is the source of all trouble. When there is no self, the heart is soft and offers no resistance to outside influences. This does not necessarily mean the absence of all sensitivities or emotionalities. They are controlled in the totality of a spiritual outlook on life. And in this aspect, I am sure that Christians and Buddhists alike know how to follow Dogen in the appreciation of the significance of selflessness or soft-heartedness. In the art of tea, the gentleness of spirit is spoken of in the same spirit enjoined by Prince Shotoku. Indeed, gentleness of spirit or soft-heartedness is the foundation of our life on earth. If the art of tea purports to establish a Buddha land in its small group, it has to start with gentleness of spirit. To illustrate this point further, let us quote Zen master Takuan, whose life bridged the 16th and 17th centuries. The principle of Cha no Yu is the spirit of harmonious blending of heaven and earth and provides the means for establishing universal peace. People of the present time have turned it into a mere occasion for meeting friends, talking of worldly affairs, and indulging in palatable food and drink. Besides, they are proud of their elegantly furnished tea rooms, where, surrounded by rare objects of art, they would serve tea in a most accomplished manner and deride those who are not so skillful as themselves. This is, however, far from being the original intention of Cha no Yu. Let us then construct a small room in a bamboo grove or under trees, 
arrange streams and rocks, and plant trees and bushes, while inside the room let us pile up charcoal, set a kettle, arrange flowers, and arrange in order the necessary tea utensils, and let all this be carried out in accordance with the idea that in this room we can enjoy the streams and rocks as we do the rivers and mountains in nature, and appreciate the various moods and sentiments suggested by the snow, the moon, and the trees and flowers as they go through the transformation of seasons, appearing and disappearing, blooming and withering. As visitors are greeted here with due reverence, we listen quietly to the boiling water in the kettle, which sounds like a breeze passing through the pine needles, and become oblivious of all worldly woes and worries. We then pour out a dipper full of water from the kettle, reminding us of the mountain stream, and thereby our mental dust is wiped off. This is truly a world of recluses, saints on earth. The principle of propriety is reverence which in practical life functions as harmonious relationship. This is the statement made by Confucius when he defines the use of propriety, and is also the mental attitude one should cultivate as cha no yu. For instance, when someone is associated with persons of high social rank, their conduct is simple and natural, and there is no cringing self-depreciation on their part. When they sit in the company of people socially below them, they retain a respectful attitude towards them, being entirely free from the feeling of self-importance. This is due to the presence of something pervading the entire tea room, which results in the harmonious relationship of all who come here. However long the association, there is always the persisting sense of reverence. The spirit of the smiling Kasyapa and the nodding Tsung Tzu must be said to be moving here. The spirit, in words, is the mysterious suchness that is beyond all comprehension. For this reason, the principle animating the tea room, from its first construction down to the choice of the tea utensils, the technique of service, the cooking of food, wearing apparel, etc., is to be sought in the avoidance of complicated ritual and mere ostentation. The implements may be old, but the mind can be invigorated therewith so that it is ever fresh and ready to respond to the changing seasons and the varying views resulting therefrom. It never carries favor, it is never covetous, never inclined to extravagance, but always watchful and considerate for others. The owner of such a mind is naturally gentle-mannered and always sincere. This is Cha no Yu. The way of Cha no Yu, therefore, is to appreciate the spirit of a naturally harmonious blending of heaven and earth, to see the pervading presence of the five elements, or Wu Sing, by one's fireside, where the mountains, rivers, rocks, and trees are found as they are in nature, to draw the refreshing water from the well of nature, to taste with one's own mouth the flavor supplied by nature, how grand this enjoyment of the harmonious blending of heaven and earth. Here ends the quotation from Takawan. Had the art of tea and Zen something to contribute to the presence of a certain democratic spirit in the social life of Japan? In spite of the strict social hierarchy established during her feudal days, the idea of equality and fraternity persists among the people. In the tea room, Ten feet square, guests of various social grades are entertained with no discrimination, for once therein, the commoner's knees touch those of the nobleman, and they talk with due reverence to each other on subjects in which they both are interested. In Zen, of course, no earthly distinctions are allowed, and its monks have free approach to all classes of society, and are at home with them all. It is indeed deeply ingrained in human nature that it aspires once in a while to throw off all the restraints society has artificially put on us and to have free and natural and heart-to-heart -heart intercourse with fellow beings, including the animals, plants, and so-called inanimate objects. We therefore always welcome every opportunity for this kind of liberation. No doubt this is what Takuan means when he refers to the harmonious blending of heaven and earth, where all angels join in the chorus. Reverence is fundamentally and originally a religious feeling. 
feeling for a being supposed to be higher than ourselves, who are, after all, poor human mortals. The feeling is later transferred to social relationships and then degenerates into mere formalism. In modern days of so-called democracy, everybody is just as good as everybody else, at least from the social point of view, and there is nobody specially deserving reverence. But when the feeling is analyzed back to its original sense, it is a reflection on one's own unworthiness, that is, the realization of one's limitations, physical and intellectual, moral and spiritual. This realization evokes in us the desire for transcending ourselves and also for coming into touch with a being who stands to us in every possible form of opposition. The desire frequently directs our spiritual movements towards an object outside us, but when it is directed within ourselves, it becomes self-abnegation and a feeling of sin. These are all negative virtues. While positively they lead us to reverence, the wish not to slight others, we are beings full of contradictions. In one respect, we feel that we are just as good as anybody else, but at the same time, we have an innate suspicion that everybody else is better than ourselves, a kind of inferiority complex. There is a bodhisattva in Mahayana Buddhism, known as Sada Paribhuta, one who never slights others. Perhaps when we are quite sincere with ourselves, that is, when we are all alone with ourselves in the innermost chamber of our being, there is a feeling there which makes us move towards others with a sense of humiliation. Whatever this may be, there is a deeply religious attitude of mind in reverence. Zen may burn all the holy statues in the temple to warm itself on a cold wintry night. Zen may destroy all the literature containing its precious legacies in order to save its very existence as the truth shorn of all its external trappings however glamorous they appear to outsiders, but it never forgets to worship a storm-broken and mud-soiled humble blade of grass. It never neglects to offer all the wild flowers of the field, just as they are, to all the Buddhas in the three thousand Chiliacosms. Zen knows how to revere because it knows how to slight. What is needed in Zen, as in anything else, is sincerity of heart and not mere conceptualization. Toyotomi Hideyoshi was the great patron of the art of tea in his day and an admirer of Sen no Rikyu, who was virtually the founder of the art in the 16th century. Although Hideyoshi was always after something sensational, grandiose and ostentatious, he seems to have understood finally something of the spirit of the art as advocated by Rikyu and his followers when he gave this verse to Rikyu at one of the latter's tea parties. When tea is made with water drawn from the depths of mind, whose bottom is beyond measure, we really have what is called cha no yu. Before going further, I should mention that in my translations of Japanese poetry, no attempt is made to reproduce the original rhythm. They are mostly literal renderings, with the fewest additions necessary to make the sense somewhat more intelligible to English listeners. Hideyoshi was a crude and cruel despot in many ways. But in his liking for the art of tea, we are inclined to find something genuine beyond just using the art for his political purposes. His verse touches the spirit of reverence when he can refer to the water deeply drawn from the well of the mind. Rikyu teaches that the art of cha no yu consists in nothing else but in boiling water, making tea and sipping it. This is simple enough as far as it goes. Human life, we can say, consists in being born eating and drinking, working and sleeping, marrying and giving birth to children, and finally in passing away, whither no one knows. Nothing seems to be simpler than living this life when it is so stated. But how many of us are there who can live this kind of matter-of-fact or rather God-intoxicated life, cherishing no desires, leaving no regrets, but absolutely trustful of God? While living we think of death, while dying, we long for life. While one thing is being accomplished, so many other things, not necessarily cognate and usually irrelevant, crowd into our brains and divert and dissipate the energy which is to be concentrated on the matter in hand. When water is poured into the bowl, it is not the water alone that is poured into it. A variety of things go into it, good and bad, pure and impure, 
things about which one has to blush, things which can never be poured out anywhere except into one's own deep unconscious. The tea water, when analyzed, contains all the filth disturbing and contaminating the stream of our consciousness. An art is perfected only when it ceases to be art, when there is the perfection of artlessness, when the innermost sincerity of our being asserts itself, and this is the meaning of reverence in the art of tea. Reverence is, therefore, sincerity or simplicity of heart. Purity, estimated as constituting the spirit of the art of tea, may be said to be the contribution of Japanese mentality. Purity is cleanliness, or sometimes orderliness, which is observable in everything everywhere concerned with the art. Fresh water is liberally used in the garden, called the roji or courtyard. In case natural running water is not available, there is a stone basin filled with water as one approaches the tea room which is naturally kept clean and free from dust and dirt. Purity in the art of tea may remind us of the Taoist teaching of purity. There is something common to both, for the object of discipline in both is to free one's mind from the defilements of the senses. A tea master says, The spirit of Cha no Yu is to cleanse the six senses from contamination. By seeing the kakemono in the alcove, or tokonoma and the flower in the vase, one's sense of smell is cleansed. By listening to the boiling of water in the iron kettle and to the dripping of water from the bamboo pipe, one's ears are cleansed. By tasting tea, one's mouth is cleansed. And by handling the tea utensils, one's sense of touch is cleansed. When thus all the sense organs are cleansed, the mind itself is cleansed of defilements. The art of tea is, after all, a spiritual discipline, and my aspiration for every hour of the day is not to depart from the spirit of the tea, which is by no means a matter of mere entertainment. Unquote. In one of Rikyu's poems we have this. While the roji is meant to be a passageway, altogether outside this earthly life, how is it that people only contrive to besprinkle it with dust of mind? Here, as in the following poems, he refers to his own state of mind while looking out quietly from his tea-room. The court is left covered with the fallen leaves of the pine-tree. No dust is stirred, and calm is my mind. The moonlight, far up in the sky, looking through the eaves, shines on a mind undisturbed with remorse. This is indeed a mind pure, serene, and free from disturbing emotions that can enjoy the aloneness of the Absolute. The snow-covered mountain path winding through the rocks has come to its end. Here stands a hut. The master is all alone. No visitors he has, nor are any expected. In a book called Nanbo Roku, which is one of the most important, almost sacred textbooks of the art of tea, we have the following passage. It shows that the ideal of the art is to realize a Buddha land of purity on earth, however small in scale, and to see an ideal community gathered here, however temporary the gathering, and however few its members. In the Nanbo Roku we read, The spirit of Wabi is to give an expression to the Buddha land of purity altogether free from defilements, and therefore in this roji, this courtyard, and in this thatched hut there ought not to be a speck of dust of any kind. Both master and visitors are expected to be on terms of absolute sincerity. No ordinary measures of proportion or etiquette or conventionalism are to be followed. A fire is made, water is boiled, and tea is served. This is all that is needed here. No other worldly considerations are to intrude. For what we want here is to give full expression to the Buddha mind. When ceremony, etiquette, and other such things are insisted on, worldly considerations of various kinds creep in, and master and visitors alike feel inclined to find fault with each other. It becomes thus more and more difficult to find such ones as fully comprehend the meaning of the art. If we were to have the Chinese Zen master Joshu for master, 
and Bodhidharma, the first Zen patriarch for a guest, and Rikyu and myself picked up the dust in the roji, would not such a gathering be a happy one indeed? Unquote. We see how thoroughly imbued with the spirit of Zen is this statement of one of the chief disciples of Rikyu. The next section will be devoted to the elucidation of sabi or wabi, the concept constituting the fourth principle of the art of tea, tranquility. In fact, this is the most essential factor in the art of tea, and without it there can be no cha no yu whatever. It is in this connection indeed that Zen enters deeply into the art of tea. <laughs> 